working on time. Hello, everybody. We thank you so much for being with us tonight. We thank you that you've taken your time out of your busy schedule to come and be in God's presence. Because I know his word says where two or three are gathered together, he's there. And we are gathered together via the wonders of technology. Word doesn't specify how we have to be gathered together. He said, just come together. And so we have come together by the incredible airways and uh, bandwidths, airways, however it does its thing. I don't know. It's all way over my head. I don't get it. But it's so cool to use it. It's so cool to use it. So let's open in prayer and um, we will move forward in Acts 25. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are sovereign. You are holy. You are the God of the universe and all of eternity, past, present, and all of eternity yet to come. You are God over all of that. And it's still just a minute thing to you. So Father, you're even God over this bandwidth and over this airways that's carrying this lesson to my precious friends. And I pray, Father, that there'll be no interruption in service or bandwidth or um, spooling or any of the te technical issues that we can encounter. You are God over all of them. So we submit to your mighty hand and we say, have your way tonight, God, in us personally, each one of us personally, as well as in um, your word. And may your will be done in our lives as a group. And in our nation, we just say a word for Israel. And we pray, Father, that you will be with them tonight and those that are fighting. And may their enemies come to know Jesus in a real way. In Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So. Last week, we ended with uh, Acts 24. And just to make a beautiful connection, I'm going to read the last verse of Acts 24, which is verse 27. So if we're all ready, tonight's lesson is, in, is entitled, In the Waiting. That's why, Natalia, I said that this could be a very good word for you. In the waiting. In the waiting. Acts 24, 27, after two years went by in this way, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. And because Felix wanted to gain favor with the Jewish people, he left Paul in prison. Now, after two years went by in this way, well, what way was that? Well, for Paul, it was sitting in a Roman holding cell. That's how it went by for Paul. And also, um, it went by just day by day, just the time lapse of a year. They're, they are now on our 365-day calendar year. Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but they're on a calendar year, 364 days, 365 days. And so two years is then is two years now. It's still the course of time, four seasons and all 12 months. And the Jewish calendar also has 12 months in it. And so two years is two years. I don't care how you count it. I don't care how you put it together. And so we have Paul stayed in prison in a Roman holding room. I don't know if he was in chains. I don't know if he was, you know, all the added information about what he was entailed in or held in, but he was isolated. He was excluded from the city. He just couldn't go in and out. 
He was given minor liberties, mainly of people coming to see him, bringing him personal supplies. They could come visit him, but he could not go out and preach. He could not go and hold crusades or meetings. He couldn't go to synagogue. Okay. So he was restricted. Um, think, remember of our time when we were, were restricted during COVID. It was that and then more on top of that. Okay. So you get the picture. We all about went crazy for three months, four months, do two years, two years plus, really. By the time we get to the end of chapter 25, it will have added even more time to Paul's holding in this Roman cell. So in prison for two years so far and being innocent of all charges. I mean, it's one thing to be held in confinement when you're guilty. It's another thing to be held in confinement when you're innocent. I've done nothing wrong. Paul keeps explaining to all these Roman government officials over him but obviously um there was no such things as a bell's bondsman in the first century um so paul had to wait no one could come and set bail for him to get him out no one could come and put up money to get him out he was confined to the location that the roman government had put him in and in this confinement, I'm sure he thought about Acts 23, 11. Let's remind ourselves what Acts 23, 11 says. Acts 23, 11 is Jesus himself coming to Paul, because in most Bibles it is written in red. And he says, at that night, the Lord appeared to Paul and said, be encouraged, Paul. Just as you have been my witness to me here in Jerusalem, you must preach the good news in Rome as well. So he had a word from God. He had a word of God saying, you are going to preach my word in Rome. But afterwards, after receiving that, Paul had to endure more than two years of Festus's refusal of the gospel. While... We have to remember that while he was held in this Roman holding room here at the end of chapter 24, Festus and Drusilla are calling for Paul periodically. Come, teach us. We want to hear again what you have to say. But every time conviction falls on Festus and he refuses. So we have a preacher confined to a room, but being called to preach, but not getting any result. How frustrating this must be to Paul. But yet he has a word. He has a word that you will be my witness in Rome, just like you've been in Jerusalem. So just think about this. Here's Paul pinned up in a holding room. In Caesarea, which Caesarea Maritime is on the seashore, okay? It's right on the shore of the Mediterranean Sea. Possibly he had a window in this room, and he could look over the sea in the direction of Rome and say, I wonder if he thought, when is my ship going to come in? When is my ship going to come so I can go to Rome and get out of this position, this holding, this Put up on the shelf. You ever been there? Have you ever felt that way? But yet every time he was called, it was refused. It was not acted on. Felix did not, I'm sorry, Festus did not respond to the gospel. Paul was preaching, fell on hard hearts, and his justice was being held by hands of hard-hearted men. Sounds like a lose-lose situation, doesn't it? Sounds like Moses and Pharaoh, almost. Moses was, would go before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh kept saying no, but Moses had a word. I will, you go, 
because I will set my people free. You know, why are there some situations harder and more taxing than others for the waiting process? Why are some situations in waiting so taxing that it just, you know, causes road rage? You know, that same person that has um, issues about sitting in traffic and waiting for the traffic to move on two lane back roads in Georgia, but there's an accident up there. My goodness, people's lives are at stake, but we still get frustrated because there's nowhere to go. We cannot go around it. We can't take another route. We're deadlocked. But my goodness, we get frustrated in the waiting. We even get frustrated in six lines of traffic down in Atlanta when it should be moving, but it's not. That's even really worse than the two lane roads. We get ballistic in the waiting. We get antsy in the waiting. But you, or my goodness, the line at Costco or the line at Sam's. Oh, there's a shorter line. Let's go over there. And you get over there and they've got three times as much as the 10 people in front of you had. And it would have been quicker just to stay where you were. Why are we so anti-waiting? What is in our nature that we cannot wait? But yet you look at the carpool moms. Carpool moms will go and sit in line for 45 minutes in front of that elementary school and be the first one in line. They'll get there early and wait for 45 minutes and never think a thing about it because they went to pick up their babies. Or what about going and sitting at the, at the, at the uh, baseball field or the soccer field for your child? You have to get there early for them to warm up and get with their team. We're sitting there 30, 45 minutes, not a care in the world. We're good sitting on a hard bleacher in the rain or the hot sun. We're okay. Why is that waiting so much easier to do than waiting in traffic? It's still waiting. It's still the same 45 minutes. We have Paul sitting here in this Roman holding room for two years. Scripture doesn't say, doesn't give any indication that he's tired of waiting. He's still preaching. Probably wishes he could get a response, but he's still doing his thing to one or two people. Probably a guard, probably other inmates maybe. But he's not preaching to the crowds like he was on his missionary journeys. Okay. So what is keeping us, which category, the anxious, the anxiety, or the, oh, this is good. I'm okay. I'm at the head of the line. Which category do you put your wedding on God for an answer to a prayer? Where are you when it comes to your prayers and the promises and the words that God has given you and you're waiting on him to answer? That's a little harder question to answer, isn't it? Because it's, well, it depends on the situation, huh? I'll take that. I agree with that. But it's still waiting. And it still goes against our human nature to have to wait. I don't care. Some people are better at it than others. And usually our spouses, one of the spouses in our, in our households are worse at it than the other. But still, and that makes them hate waiting, you know? So now you got two people that are hate waiting. So Paul is here in this position of waiting, waiting on God. In addition to this custody that Paul was in, Paul was subject to other long stretches of time during which he could do little but trust God and wait on him to act. I bet if I took a poll, every single person that's hearing this can think of a situation that you're trusting God for and waiting on him to act. We all have something that we're waiting on God to act in our behalf. 
What do we do when that issue comes in the and waiting on God? Like I asked, do we get anxious or angry, discouraged? Do you take the matter into your own hands? Few things test our patience and faith like being forced to wait. Should I say that again? Few things test our faith and our patience like being forced to wait. Which perhaps explains why our sovereign God often puts us in situations where we have no choice. He's kind of good like that. <laughs> When we stop and look at the situation, it does reflect his goodness to us. I picked up this book that I read during COVID, Out, Out of Your Comfort Zone. The subtitle is Your God Too Nice. It's by R.T. Kendall. If you haven't read it, I would highly recommend it. It's excellent. And on page 89, he makes this statement. God always has looked for what will offend sophisticated people, possibly because he wants to put obstacles in our way to see if we will believe in his word only. This is because faith, to be faith, is believing God without evidence of that belief, only his word. In other words, that which makes faith faith is when you keep trusting what God says, although you're not able to prove your point. That's where Paul was. Paul knew he was innocent and he was trusting God to be his defender. Are you there? Do you have something that you are believing God for? And only his word is the only thing that you can put your faith in. It's a good place to be, actually. There's several others in scripture that were there. Let's look at uh, Psalm 37. Paul, being brought up a good Jew, knew these psalms. And I'm quite confident that Paul, being the man of God that he was, remembered these psalms in this time while he was set apart by himself, just him and Jesus. Let's look at Psalm 37, verse 3, and I'm reading out of the NIV. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when men succeed in their ways when they carry out their wicked schemes. And then verse 23 of that same passage also says, if the Lord delights in a man's way, he makes his steps firm. Though he stumble, he will not fall for the Lord upholds him with his hand. So Paul was considering he told, he told us in his epistles to meditate on the word, to think on these things, think on what's good and what's right. So in Psalm 37, the word is, so you see the words that I have underlined in my notes, trust in the Lord and what will happen and do good. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit everything to the Lord. Trust in him and he will help you. You see the back and forth? If we trust, this is what the Lord will do. If we trust him, this is what the Lord will do. If we commit everything to him and trust him, this is what the Lord will do. And Paul, of all people, needed his innocence to radiate like the dawn and his justice to shine forth like the noonday sun, did he not? 
did he not need for his justice to be proven? And then be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Another psalm that I have here is Psalm 56, verses 3 and 4. And this is for everyone. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear. For what can flesh do to me? Are you at that place of peace tonight in your situations that you're trusting God with? Or are you wanting to still make it happen by your own hand? This is what Paul was doing for those two years in this Roman holding room. I can, I can imagine. David wrote these Psalms when he was being pursued by Saul. He was being chased down. He too was looking to be killed. He too had uh, someone had his head that wanted to get him out of the picture, just like these Jews wanted Paul out of the picture. Moses in front of Pharaoh, David with Saul, and Paul now with these Jews plotting to kill him, all waited and trusted God to move on their behalf. Can we do the same? God hasn't changed. Our, cir our circumstances are no bigger or no smaller than what they faced. Can we trust God and wait patiently? Can we wait without complaining and even constant praying to God about the situation? Faith prays about it occasionally because God doesn't forget. He hasn't forgotten your cause. He hasn't left you abandoned. I would actually think it would be impossible for him to do that because he promises that he will never leave you nor forsake you. Let's get back to Acts 25. So this is this, the picture, the setup, the situation that Paul is in. So let's start at Acts 25 and I'll start at verse one and I'm going to uh, read from 1 to 12, and then we'll talk about it. And I'm reading out of um, the New Living Translation, just for ease of reading. Three days after Festus arrived in Caesarea, he took over his new responsibilities and left for Jerusalem, where the leading priest and the other Jewish leaders met with him and made their accusations against Paul. So here this man, been in office for three days, decides, okay, I need to go up to Jerusalem. I need to see what's going on in the capital city. I'm going to make a journey up there. And as soon as he gets there, who finds him? But these Jewish leaders that have are still, after two years, still, after two years, has a grudge against Paul and are still plotting to kill him. So verse three, they asked Festus as a favor to transfer Paul to Jerusalem, planning to ambush and kill him on the way. See, where clearly says they're still plotting to kill Paul. But Festus replied that Paul was in Caesarea and he himself would be returning there soon. So he said, those of you in authority can return with me. If Paul has done anything wrong, you can make your accusations. Verse 6, about eight or ten days later, Festus returned to Caesarea, and on the following day, he took his seat in court and ordered that Paul be brought in. When Paul arrived, the Jewish leaders from Jerusalem gathered around and made many serious accusations they couldn't prove. Well, Paul denied the charges. I'm not guilty of any crime against the Jewish laws or the temple or the Roman government, he said. And then Festus, wanting to please the Jews, just like who? Just like Felix. Festus, wanting to please the Jews, asked him, are you willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there? 
But Paul replied, no, this is the official Roman court. So I ought to be tried right here. You know very well, I am not guilty of harming the Jews. And if I have done something worth of, worthy of death, I don't refuse to die. But if I am innocent, no one has the right to turn me over to these men to kill me. I appealed to Caesar. So there you have it. Caesar, verse 12, Caesar conferred with his advisors and then replied, very well, you have appealed to Caesar and to Caesar you will go. So he made his, his point. They discussed it. Paul took his stand and everyone agreed. Okay, you can go to Caesar, not a problem. And just to uh, Caesar, um, is, would be like our president. So really, in today's type of situation, it would be going to the Supreme Court. They really, I read several commentaries, and they really did not appear specifically in front of Caesar necessarily. He did a few, but it was more like his delegated um judgmental appointees that made judgments for him specifically. Um, so who was this Festus? Who was this man Festus? Last week we talked about Felix and we talked about uh, Lycidius and we Drusilla and Tertullus. Well, this week we have Festus. So who was Festus? Unfortunately, there's very little known about him, but he was Felix's um, uh, successor as pro procreator of Judah, but he only served for two years, from 60 to 62 AD. And unlike his successor, who was very cruel, greedy, and evil, Festus was of a very noble family in Rome. And he was an honorable man. He was indicated as being a wise man. But he died shortly after his two-year reign. So there wasn't a lot that we know about Festus. But he was trying to do Paul right. He asked the, the Jews that had something against him, you come to Caesarea, where he is, and we'll try him there. Then he asked Paul, do you want to go to Jerusalem? No. Very well. You appeal to Caesar? Well, then to Caesar you will go. And that's where we left it in verse 12. Um, I know you guys are literate and you could read this for yourself, but I'm going to... We need this. The story is such a continuation of story if we don't finish 25, then it will be hard to pick up in 26. So back at verse 13, let's finish the chapter here and see what actually happens to Paul and Festus. And we get another character in the mix, King Agrippa. So verse 13, a few days later, King Agrippa arrived with his sister Beatrice to pay their respects to Festus. During their stay of several days, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. Here again, wanting to get input, wanting to gain wisdom about what he was going to be um, presenting. There is a prisoner here, he told him, whose case was left for me by Festus, verse 15. When I was in Jerusalem, the leading priest and Jewish elders pressed ag charges against him and asked me to condemn him. I pointed out to them that Roman law does not convict people without a trial. They must be given an opportunity to confront their accusers and defend themselves. This is where we get the saying, innocent until proven guilty. You will see a lot of parallelism between our government and this ancient, ancient Roman government. You are innocent until proven guilty. 
That was the statement that they even used that same right of rule in ancient Rome. There must be given an opportunity to confront their accusers and defend themselves. Verse 17, when his accusers came here for the trial, I didn't delay. I called the case the very next day and ordered Paul brought in. But the accusations made against him weren't any of the crimes I expected. Now, this is um, Felix re relating to King Agrippa, the story that happened earlier. Okay, this has happened earlier, and he's just relating a story to King Agrippa to bring him up to speed. Okay, verse um, 19. Instead, it was something about their religion and a dead man named Jesus, who Paul insisted is alive. I was at a loss to know how to investigate these things, so I asked him whether he would be willing to stand trial on these charges in Jerusalem. But Paul appealed to his case, deciding by the emperor. So I ordered that he be held in custody until I could arrange to send him to Caesar. I'd like to hear the man myself, Agrippa said. And Festus replied, you will tomorrow. So that's one day. They get filled in. Agrippa says, you know, this is a case I'd really like like some more understanding about. So the next day, verse 23, we're almost done. The next day, Agrippa and Bernice arrived at the auditorium with the great pomp accompanied by military officers and prominent men of the city. Felix ordered that Paul be brought in. Then Festus says, King Agrippa and all who are here, this is the man whose death is demanded by all the Jews, both here and in Jerusalem. But in my opinion, he has done nothing deserving of death. However, since he appealed his case to the emperor, I have decided to send him to Rome. But what shall I write to the emperor? For there is no clear charge against him. So I have brought him before all of you, and especially you, King Agrippa, so that after we examine him, I might have something to write, for it makes no sense to send a prisoner to the emperor without specifying the charges against him. So he was trying to find something that would warrant him going to the emperor. And we will find out what they do in chapter 26. But all this waiting, all this waiting, it's hard. And we don't understand sometimes why God answers somebody's prayers immediately and why other people's prayers take years, decades, even lifetimes. My father went to the grave with some of his prayers yet unanswered. And I'm sure you could tell stories of the same. But we have a sovereign God. And that's not that word sovereign connected to God is not used a lot in some churches today. But we have a sovereign God. I worship, I choose to declare that my God is sovereign. And what does that what does that mean? Well, in my same little book, I can't give I cannot give a better explanation than what R.T. Kendall gives. I will now define what I mean by sovereignty of God. It is God's authority to do what he pleases with whom he pleases and his will whenever he chooses to do his will. He does not need to explain himself as he is answerable to no one. The key verse for me is Exodus 33, 19, which came as God's response to Moses' request to see the glory of God. Haven't we all requested that? Haven't we all asked to see God's glory? Well, I wonder what he told Moses. Exodus 33, 19, he tells Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. 
and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. God blesses whom he chooses, withholding judgment, which is mercy from those who deserve it, and bestowing grace, undeserved favor on those who don't deserve it. That's the sovereignty of God, for which to our human brains and our human hearts cannot wrap that understanding. We can't grasp that understanding. But that's the God that I serve. And I personally choose not to fret about it. I have in the past, but I've gotten to the place that I go, I can't make I, I can't waste my waste. That's the wrong word. I can't spend my precious spiritual energy on wondering why God hasn't answered my prayer, but he's answered somebody else's prayer. I have to trust him for his best for me. And if he knows me and he loves me, like the word says he does, that there's not even two fingerprints the same of the 12 billion, however many billions of people there are in the world, there's no two snowflakes the same. There's no two changing of leaves that are falling and raining out of our trees the same. Does God not know me well enough to do his will to me and act on my behalf as he knows best for me? That's where I have to rest. God has challenged me to trust him more than I even love him. Because out of the love, out of the trust comes love. I have to trust God and love you. That trust in him helps me to love you. Helps me to love you more. Because it's out of that trust that I know even if someone some person hurts me I can trust God to take care of that so we love people and trust God not the other way around because the other way around always gets messed up so trust God love people and I leave with you tonight Lyrics to a song. If you were around with Maranatha Music in 1979, this song might be familiar to you. It's an oldie but goodie. It was by Randy Thomas, and it's at the end of your notes, and I gave you a link that you'd be able to listen to it. We must wait, wait, wait on the Lord. We must wait, wait, wait on the Lord. We must learn our lessons well. We're in his timing. He will tell us what to do, where to go, and what to say. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, that you're worth waiting on. Just say that. Say, God. Your plan is worth waiting on. It always is. And it always will be. Amen. <laughs>